Well, the marketers know when it's best to make demands of government. And I know that governments in Nigeria always want to make sure that there's no fuel issues around the Christmas holiday. When Nigerians typically travel a lot, when Nigerians are more responsive to problems from strikes or from, for, or from disruptions in the full supply market. So the, the phone marketers know that if you want to make demands of government, this is the best time to do it if you want them to actually take you seriously. One minute, there's no first subsidy. The other minute, we're hearing it's called under recovery. What's really playing out here? Well, it's kind of complicated. So I think the first subsidy claims that the oil marketers want are actually back claims, so claims that they've been owed for a while. So in the past regime, we had a system where the NMPC did deals with oil marketers to bring in fuel, and then they pay all the costs, including interest rate, interest rate charges and exchange rate differentials and all that. The new government came in and stopped that, but the old government still owed a lot of money to oil marketers. So I think the, the strikes are about what is already owed. But there is a subsidy now that is incorporated into NMPC's account. So it's no longer done through independent importers of refined fuel, but it's done through NMPC importing refined fuel itself and then distributing to marketers. So there's a different uh, kind of subsidy. It's still there, but I think the strike is about what is owed from the past administration. But so when you look at this ultimatum coming in, what do you think is the worst case scenario here? Well, the oil marketers still own a significant part of the depots and distribution system. So even though NMPC brings in fuel, they still rely on marketers to distribute it. So if they go on strike, then all of a sudden the capacity to distribute for across Nigeria is degraded, and that would result in scarcity. It's automatic. Right? All right, then. Very interesting. Let's look at some of the data we, from the story I read earlier on, you know, about the economy. And um, we're seeing revenue challenges here from the government again, here in We're seeing revenue were down 38.4%. Well, it's part of the dependence on the oil industry story, right? So we've, we've done a lot of work to bring oil production back up to 1.8% barrels, million barrels per day. Mm. So that has seen an increase in government revenue. But at the same time, we're still subject to fluctuations in the global oil markets. Prices fluctuate from 80 to 60 to 70 and up and down. And so those fluctuations impact whatever revenue comes in. Then so there's second line items like the subsidy, which is growing, which has you know, cut off a big chunk of the, the inflows that should have flowed in from the oil industry. Um, we've seen cuts there. Um, but I think the big issue is still that the government is still largely dependent on, on all, Im all imports, on all, all revenues, and that is very volatile. So you would see volatility in government's oil revenue. Yeah, but from that CBN report, we're seeing that non oil exports are also doing quite good. It was up 45.7%. Well, it's up, but I mean, just the fact that it's 45.7% means that it's still a very small amount. For something to grow that large in a short period of time means it's a very small amount. So it's still very volatile as well. If yeah. you, if it, it could drop by 30% in the next quarter, we don't know. But it's a small fraction of the total revenue picture for the federal government. Um, so you see large good numbers, but in terms of this contribution to the overall picture, it's still relatively small. So when you look at budget and budget implementation so far, as an economist, what, what uh, would you say are your key flashpoints that you, you would like to be resolved? Well, there are two key flashpoints. The first is the budgets have been overly optimistic. So if you look at the budget implementation reports, they're always 25% below target, 30% below target, which is a really big gap. Um, so they're always overly optimistic so that when they don't hit the target, it now looks really bad. So the first thing is to get the budgets to become more realistic, right? You're not going to grow revenues by 40, 50% in a year. It's not going to happen. Growth happens over time. So if you're more realistic, then you kind of can deal with whatever small shortfalls you find. The second big picture is that the revenue, the expenditure is growing a lot faster than the revenue is growing. And so you're beginning to see bigger and bigger deficits. So I think last year, according to the implementation reports, we actually crossed the fiscal deficit ceiling for the first time in a long time. So it's a big problem. The overall picture of debt is relative to GDP is still manageable, but revenue is not growing as fast as expenditure. And that's a big, you know, yeah, sticking but, point. But debt, debt, debt servicing, there's been a lot of, um, about debt servicing, and it, you know, it's, it's really, really sad. How do you think we can you know, structurally adjust um, and pre prevent these kind of mishaps? Well, in the long term, the country needs to move from being a government that depends on oil revenue to being a government that depends on tax revenue. That isn't really about making small marginal changes, but it's about much bigger tax reform, but how you design your tax structure. That hasn't happened. And until that happens, it's difficult to see how it would migrate from a country that depends on oil, which is very volatile, to a country that depends on taxes, which is more stable. So that's the thing that needs to happen. That hasn't happened yet. We hope it happens 
you know, at some point in the future. But as time goes on, as the economy gets bigger, then the pressure for that to happen increases, right? Because we're, we're, we're a bigger and bigger economy, but we've been producing 1.82 million barrels per day for the last 30, 40 years, and that's not going to change. Right? But when you look back at the recent data that was released around the IGR for states, you look at some states doing excellent work, they're doing very excellent things. You look at Lagos State, look at Ogun State, look at River State. But then on the other end, you look at a bunch of other states, it speaks to the viability of some of these states. You know, do you think we need to, as a country, have a rethink on how many states that we have? Well, I like to think that everything can always be improved, right? There's some states that will be better off merging, for mm -hmm. sure. Um, there's some states that might be better off as they are now. So there's always an opportunity to improve the situation. But we have to be politically realistic, right? Creating states is easy. Dismantling states is difficult because people don't want to go back to having one governor when they had two. The people who will lose will complain. Um, so we have to be a bit realistic when we talk about how to disaggregate states. At the very least, we should not be trying to create more states. And I think politically, we've kind of accepted that. I don't think anybody's trying to create any new states anytime soon. But we need to think about how we will redesign the tax structure so that states that are there can be viable and more importantly, that they can support economic activity, because that's the underlying factor. If there's no economic activity in the states, then the state can't generate revenue, and that's the reality. So we need to rethink how we, you know, we need to redesign our tax structure so that mm -hmm. we can start to link government revenues to people's economic activity. If economic, if economic activity grows, revenue grows, and you have that symbiotic relationship. Very interesting. So now I'd like to look, you know, at some data expected in this week, we're expecting, um, um, GDP figures to come in, you know, we're also expecting unemployment figures to come in much later on. What are your expectations? Well, I think we would see a bit more of the same because there's really nothing that you can point to that can boost growth per se. The oil industry has kind of recovered from the crippling days of, you know, the disruption from damage to pipelines. So we've recovered to about 1.8 million barrels per day. There's some fluctuation around that, but that's pretty stable. So there's no growth to come from the oil industry in the near term. Mm. 